Hello everyone, we are starting module 6 uh, today. The theme of the module 6 is we are going to discuss directory coherence case studies. And uh, in this module, we are going to do two case studies. One is on the SGI origin architecture and the second one is in the sequent NUMA Q architecture. The first one is a flat memory based uh, directory protocol and the second is a flat cache based directory protocol. In each of these designs, we are going to look at the architecture, how the protocol works and the correctness aspects. So, we will start with the first lecture which covers the SGI origin architecture. Okay. So, this is a uh, directory protocol, therefore there is no snooping among the processors. So, even if there is a bus available, the processors are not going to snoop on the bus because there is going to be no transmission of snoop messages onto the bus. And there is going to be a separate directory controller which is going to handle actual one to one messages from the controller to the uh, cache coherence controller. So, there is going to be a coherence controller uh, or uh, with every node there is going to be a coherence controller or the cache controller which is going to handle these messages coming from the directory control. And the SGI origin is a uh, slightly older machine but uh, it gives you a flavor of how a directory protocol will be implemented in a real system. More advanced versions of this are implemented in uh, today's processors. So, we will start with the uh, overview of the architecture or how the system looks like and then in the next lecture we will look at how the protocol works. So, this SGI architecture is made up of one uh, board on which we have two processors on it. So, every processor is the R10000 uh, MIPS architecture. These processors are connected to each other uh, through a system bus but they do not implement a snooping protocol. Overall, these are connected to the outside world through a uh, module called the hub. Okay, so, we look at the architecture now. So, this is one board I would say. So, one PCB board is this one rectangle and you can have several such connected to the interconnection network. Every board consists of two processors. Every processor is a R10000 MIPS architecture processor. These are connected to each other through a system address and data bus. This bus is only used for communication to other modules but not inter-processor communication. Both of them are connected to the module called hub which is the main module implementing the directory protocol. Every PCB board or every node of a 2000 processor consists of a slice of the global memory. It has uh, from 1 to 4 GB of global memory and a directory associated with it. Now, you can um, recollect that we when we discussed directory protocols, we said that the directory information is stored with the home node and the home node's information is kept with the main memory. Okay. So, these are some more details of the architecture. Every processor has got a um, 4 MB cache with 128 byte blocks and two way set associative. The processors are 195 megahertz processors and they give a peak performance of either 390 M flops or 780 MIPS. Overall, uh, if I am going to connect such uh, several boards to an interconnection network, we are going to get a improved system level performance and the max number of uh, processors which I can connect to origin 2000 system is 1024. So, if I have 1024 processors, I am going to have 512 such boards connected to the network. So, you can imagine the scale of the system, this is very big and if your application is going to run on several of these processors or several of these nodes sharing data across each other, uh, you can imagine the scale of coherence management which we have to handle. The max system performance is 500 G flops. The sysadd bus that is the system address and data bus is a 780 megabytes per second link. Uh, it is mainly used for inter board communication and not inter processor communication. The overall memory bandwidth is this and the hub which is the main directory coherence controller module it connects to the outside router at a 1.56 gbps link. Okay. So, 
that was a quick overview. We are going to uh, see more details of how we expand this small diagram to a bigger network. But before that, uh, what happens to the directory? I mean, is the directory going to consider every processor within this um, board as a single processor? That is, is this board, is this one board one node or is it consisting of two processors and are they independent to each other ok. So, this every processing node has got two MIPS processors, but they would be treated independently by the coherence controller. Overall, uh, we have seen that we have a main memory module, an I.O. interface, a communication assist which is the hub. So, hub is called the coherence controller or the communication assist. This hub has to do all the job for coherence and hence it should be capable of uh, accessing the memory system as well as the caches. So, it has to be tightly integrated with the memory system of every processing node. It is going to see all the cache misses because it handles coherence whenever there is a cache miss it has to go to the hub. So, hub has to be capable of handling all the cache misses. It should also be able to receive transactions coming from the outside network and also capable of retrieving data from the caches, ok. So, this hub which you can see here, it should be able to see all the cache misses coming out from the processor node. It should uh, definitely be able to read and write to this memory. It should be able to go and retrieve data from these caches and also uh, send and receive messages to the uh, interconnect. Okay, so this is a zoomed out picture of that same processing node. Now, let us look into more details of this uh, particular one node. So, this is the hub and the hub is now connected to the main memory here and it is also connected to several other IO or peripherals. So, in the peripherals we have the network and the IO ports. And this hub is called the heart of the chip because it is going to do all the job for us related to the coherence. It connects this one node with other nodes in the system through the XBO switch. So, we are going to look at this switch. So, one hub goes outside connects to the XBO switch and from there it connects to other nodes and uh, hub implements the coherence protocol ok. So, you can see in this picture we have a hub connected to this expo module. Every expo module is an 8 port crossbar because it has got 8 ports, 1, 2 going to the hubs, 2 ports going to a graphics uh, processing unit and another 4 connected to different bridges. Now, these bridges are used for other IO or connecting to the disks and uh, other peripherals. So, the uh, expo switch is going to connect two hubs to the outside network. So, all the other IO devices connect through the bridge to the expo, whereas the graphics devices and the hubs connect directly to the expo. Every processor in this whole system, right now I have got two hubs, so you will have four processors. If you have multiple such uh, nodes connected, you will have multiple such processors uh, in the system. So, when I am saying I connect this one node to several such through a scalable interconnect, every IO device is capable of accessing the memory location from any board in the system. Here I have two hubs, so I have connected two boards. If I connect four or 16, I am able to access the data from any memory and from any IO device. Okay, so, that is the capability of the system because the expo and the hub together help us to enable accessing data from uh, any module in the system. Okay. So, when I want to grow my network from a two hub system to multiple, in the previous diagram we had just two hubs, now I am going to connect it to more. So, this expo switch should be able to uh, help me connect to other nodes. How does it connect? Now, it has got 8 ports and I am going to uh, connect one, one expo which is the router to another router ok. So, here uh, I have shown you a bigger network. If we have a 4 node system then this is the expo router and that router connects to 2 hubs which are the 2 nodes. 
apart from other peripherals it also connects to the next expo. So, I have got two routers and each router connects to two nodes this way I have a four node system constructed. If you want to construct an eight node system then every expo should now connect to each other in this format and uh, apart from connecting to two nodes of its own. That is a 8 node system. Beyond that when you go you have to construct a hypercube topology that is it forms a cube like this to connect to a 16 node system. Now I have a cube of 8 routers that is 8 expos. Every router is going to connect to 2 nodes hence I have a 16 node system which is equal to a 32 processor system. Okay. When I want to construct or double this size, we will have two such 16 node systems where every router is now connected to three other routers. So, four other routers rather. So, here I have one, two, three in my own uh, 16 node plane and the fourth link will go to a different cluster. So, this is my within a 16 node cluster and this goes to another 16 node. Okay, so, you can see this is the link which connects from this 16 node to the other 16 node. Expanding it further we can have a 64 node system, but for that you will need a meta router to connect because we have got only 4 links. Hence, um, instead of this link connecting to this cluster it connects itself to the meta router and through the meta router it is going to the next 16 node cluster. Okay. So, these are some latency figures uh, how the physical wires are connected and overall uh, we have got four virtual channels here one for request reply and other two for priority and input output. You recollect uh, from the previous lecture that virtual channels are used for avoiding deadlocks and sending logically different pathways for different types of messages. Okay. So, this origin architecture is uh, has to implement the directory protocol and what type of a directory protocol it implements. We had seen three varieties, one was a strict request response, one was intervention forwarding and third was uh, reply forwarding. So, origin architecture is implementing the reply forwarding type of directory protocol. So, when a request comes to the directory, it is not going to send a reply back to the requester, but it is going to send an intervention to the owner if there is one and this owner will then send a reply back to the home as well as to the requester. So, that is the uh, reply forwarding method. Apart from that to optimize on the latency, the origin architecture says that if the directory needs to fetch the data from the owner up in parallel, it also sends the data to the requester just in case the data is useful. So, this is called a speculative reply and for this it has to uh, do a parallel lookup of its own memory module to forward the data to the uh, requester. This uh, speculative data which reaches to the requester may or may not be used by the requester because in case the owner had a dirty copy, the dirty copy will be forwarded to the requester which will then be utilized. For the protocol, the two processors in the node are treated separately. So, it is not a single processor, but uh, or a single node. Every node has got two processors. So, when I am uh, talking to one processor, we can refer directly to the processor or to the node. And when I refer to a node, I am referring to the hub because then the hub has to uh, broadcast the request to both the processors. So, the unit of visibility is either the processor or the hub and this unit will be more clear when we look at the directory structure in the next slide. Okay. So, we have reply forwarding and speculative memory operations. Every processor is treated as a separate processor and uh, not part of the node because they do not do snooping with each other because they do not use snooping and this will also mean that we cannot do cache to cache sharing between the two processors within the same node. And we have already understood how the hub works, it uh, is shared by both the processors and the directory apart from using reply forwarding, it is going to use the busy states to indicate uh, or to help in the serialization and correctness aspects. So, when the directory is servicing a request, it goes into the busy state, hence future requests will be NACed 
to resolve any race conditions and provide serialization with respect to the home node. And uh, these NACs will also help us in deadlock and live lock solutions. Okay. So now we have to uh, think about the different states of the protocol. We have two processors in the node which have caches. So cache is going to implement the messy protocol in this particular architecture. So you can recollect how the messy protocol works. Now apart from these MESI four states with the cache, we also need to keep states with the directory. Now you would say, why do I need to keep states in the directory? Because we never did this in the snooping protocol. What happened in the snooping? When there was a cache miss, we sent it onto the bus. Every cache snooped onto it and then using the shared wire dot signals, it was indicating the status of the cache block across different nodes. So the state was given implicitly using snooping. But in a directory, we have to give an explicit information about the states. So if a cache is in a M or E or S state, the directory should have the correct information about this. Hence, the directory also has to maintain state of these shared cache blocks. Now, what could be the different states? In origin protocol, we have got seven states. One is an unowned. Unowned, as the word says, there is no sharer of this data block. The block is there in the memory, but nobody is sharing it. Then the second state is shared, where there are multiple, one or more uh, copies, where the data is in read-only manner. We have a third state called exclusive. Exclusive, as the word says, exactly one sharer is there in the system. Now, uh, here the difference could be that is this sharer the read-only copy or a dirty copy? Well, the directory does not keep this information. It only says I have exactly one sharer for this block and it leaves it to the sharer to identify whether the copy was dirty or clean. So these are the three states and related to various actions of the directory, we would have three pending states or busy states. So when the directory is busy serving a read reply, it will go into a busy state for reading, busy state for writing and busy state for uncached reads because um, if there is a DMA or an IO data transfer, these are not necessarily related to coherence and hence uh, these are those blocks which will not be cached. They will be simply sent from the memory to the other node. So we will have three pending states uh, for that. So that covers six states. And the seventh state is a special case with this directory when uh, I will have a page migration from the memory of this node to another node. So when the data moves from my memory to another memory, the directory entry related to my memory bank has to be deleted. So when I'm doing this, the directory also goes into a busy state, but that is not related to coherence. Hence, it is called a poisoned state where uh, the directory stops all the requests, moves the page and then restarts the accesses. Okay, so we'll look at all these states now. So we have seven states, unowned, shared, exclusive and three pending states. In the shared, the memory copy is always valid, but in the exclusive, we cannot guarantee that the memory copy will be valid or not. Because when a block is in exclusive state with one cache, that cache will have the permission to either uh, modify the block or not. So that is the uh, E state in the messy protocol, which immediately moves to the M state. Okay, and then uh, we have busy states to indicate that the directory is currently servicing a previous request. It hasn't yet finished it and hence to guarantee serialization, it would go into the busy state and not service future transactions until the ongoing request is complete. So these are the three busy states, busy for an ongoing read, busy for an ongoing write. Now write requests could be write uh, that is a pure write that is read exclusive or if you already have a copy it could be an upgrade request and the third is when the uh, block is being accessed by IO or by DMA for an uncached read. So we will have to consider the first two cases uh, related to the coherence protocol. The seventh state is the poison state which is used uh, when the page gets migrated from one node to the other and the TLB has to be updated. So during this, the directory goes into busy state. Again, uh, we are not going to deal with this particular seventh state. Okay, understanding the states, now we have to look inside the directory structure. How is the directory information stored? 
So directory is stored as a flat memory based. When you say flat memory based, we have a bit vector. What is the size of the bit vector? We have a 64 bit vector. If I have 64 bits, I can address 64 nodes because if you can recollect a bit vector essentially it has a one to one correspondence between the uh, index position and the processor ID. So if this bit is 0, the cache block is not shared in the processor. If this bit is 1, then the block is shared in that particular processor. Now with 64 bits, I can only address 64 nodes. But in the first few slides, we saw that there are 1024 processors possible to be connected in an origin 2000 system. So we have to now see how can I manage a 64 bit entry to cater to a 1024 node system. Okay. So with these 64 nodes, I can have three methods of or uh, three meanings associated with it. One is the 64 bit entry is an exclusive entry. What does exclusive mean? It's not the exclusive state. This exclusive entry means that there is exactly one processor holding the block and when I have just one sharer, why to maintain the bit vector with several zeros and a one, but I would simply store a pointer to the processor ID using this 64 bit. Now it is sufficient for any system because if I have a 64 bit entry, I can have 2 power 64 coverage. So uh, that solves my problem when I have an exclusive pointer. What happens when I have different sharers that is it is actually a bit vector. So the presence bits will indicate the sharer identity. But now here I cannot go beyond 64 node system. So we will see how to solve that using our overflow schemes which we studied that is the course vector format where every bit in the bit vector will now represent multiple nodes. Okay. So in a shared bit vector, the bits correspond to the nodes and not the processors. And now you need to remember this that I have got 64 nodes which I can connect and if I can connect 64 nodes, a 64 bit vector will cover 128 processors. So a bit vector is not covering the processors, but it covers the node. So if I am saying my bit is equal to 1 and uh, if I send some message to this particular node, then it is the job of the hub in the system to transmit or replicate our request, our coherence request to both the processors because the two processors are not snoop coherent. In case they were snoop coherent, then the hub would simply put the message onto the bus and the both processors or any number of processors within that system could pick up that message. But now they are not. We actually have a processor P1, another P2, both of them connected to the hub. So any coherence message which comes from outside, hub has to broadcast it to both of them. Okay, so invalidation, uh, or any request which is coming will be broadcasted by the hub. Okay. How are the bit vectors stored? Uh, the bit vectors are actually divided into two partitions. We have a 16 bit format in case you have lesser processors, you are uh, okay with having a 16 bit uh, format and do not need more storage. But if you want a full 64 bit vector which can cover more processors, then these extra bits that is the other 48 bits will be stored in the external directory memory. Okay, so we will see it here. So this was the uh, one node with two processors, the hub. Now that main memory had uh, the data and a 16 bit directory entry. Only 16 bits are stored with the DRAM. These are the uh, memory bank controllers and these are the second level caches. So these 16 bits are with the memory. If we want a 64 bit vector, the extra bits will be kept in this extended directory. All right. So these are with the DRAM and these are in the external storage. This is how we will maintain those 64 bits. In case um, I am storing a pointer, now this pointer is to a processor and not to a node. Bit vector points to nodes, pointers that is exclusive pointer points to the processor IDs. So if I have a smaller system, I can accommodate using 16 bits. So we will directly point to a processor within this node. So this node has got two processors and a pointer will now point to a particular processor and not to the node. Again, uh, if you have a bigger system, you can go for a 64 bit exclusive pointer, which can point to any processor within this. So this router has got two nodes. 
each node has got two processors ok. So, that pointer is going to point to this particular processor and not to the node. Second one is when I have a shared state it is a bit vector but bit vectors point to nodes. So, here I have two nodes and the pointer will be pointing to the node any request from this will be then broadcast by the hub to the two processors. So, bits are pointing to the nodes. Now, what happens if I have more nodes in the system with 64 bit format I can go only up to how many nodes in the system 64 nodes which is 128 processors, but I have 1024 processors possible in my system hence I have to group them together. So, if I have a p node system we can have p by 64 as the group size and uh, for our example with 1024 processors there are 2 processors in every node which makes it 512 nodes and uh, which further makes it 8 nodes in one set. So, when I have a bit vector every bit is going to point to a cluster of 8 nodes. The system will then dynamically choose between the course vector and the bit vector. Why? Because if the cache block is uh, shared between limited number of nodes then I can accommodate using a plain bit vector, I will go for a plain bit vector. If the sharing goes beyond the capacity of a plain vector then we will shift to a course vector. So, this is done at runtime by the directory controller. So, same thing here for 1024 this becomes a 64 bit vector where every bit every bit in this is now going to point to 8 nodes and when I say 8 nodes up to 16 processors. So, if I am going to send an invalidation to this, this invalidation will be received by 8 hubs and each hub will send it to uh, broadcast it to the 2 internal processors ok. So, uh, we have seen the architecture, the directory states and overall how the storage is managed with the directory. In the next lecture, we are going to see how the protocol actually works. So, we will stop this lecture. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.